folks. It's almost the end. But here we are again. Um, wanted to take a quick second and give a big thanks to our 2020 sponsors. That's Checkmarks, Google, and Offensive Security. Thank you all so much for helping to make the AppSec Village happen. Uh, we could have done it without you. If you haven't gotten your shirt yet, go to appsecvillage.com and pick up your t-shirt. Uh, also, if you're interested in making sure that this is a lasting thing, go out and become a super fan for us. Um, that would go a long way towards helping to make sure that hopefully if next year's DEF CON is in person, AppSec Village will be part of it. All right. Without any further introduction or me talking, uh, we are going to hear a talk from Mehmet Ines, uh Managing Partner at Invictus in Cyber Intelligence. He's going to be talking about a haven for hackers, breaking a web security virtual appliance. With that, please help me welcome to the stage, Mehmet. Let's talk about finding a zero-day vulnerabilities. Um, in that presentation, I'm trying to take you all to the journey with me to finding uh, different vulnerabilities in a security solutions and combination of them will give us a remote code execution with a root user. Um, this is Mehmet. Uh, I've been doing vulnerability researching since 2005, and I'm working for a company, Imictus Cybersecurity and Intelligence. And this is my Twitter address, MDISEC, and pantest.blog is a web page where me and my teammates are uh, sharing our uh, technical research in here. Okay, so. Heaven for Hackers, third edition. Actually, there's a story behind of that title, and it has started back in 2017. And I was doing a pen testing for a company, and there was a blue team members, and they were telling me, you are doing this, et cetera, and et cetera. And I was start thinking about what happens if we somehow manage to break in into your same uh, product of that, that they are using and write a custom rule in order to become a total invisible. Which are, because they are telling us what they are seeing in the product and if we become uh, invisible, that would be so nice. So that, uh, that idea led me to defining a remote code execution on our various different SIEM and the log management solutions back in the 2017. And after one year, uh, I was trying to send an email to a friend of mine, and that dude was not receiving any email from me at all. And it turn, turned out that it, there was a problem on the email security gateways, and they managed to solve the problem, and eventually we started sending an email to each other. And I was uh, thinking that, all right, there is an email security gateway product, and what happens if I manage to break in into your email security gateways? Uh, so that I can read all the emails incoming and the outgoing. So um, that idea uh, motivates me to finding a zero-day uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities on Symantec, Microfocus, and the Trank Macro. And uh, previous year, I was working a, another client, and the project was uh, hardening the client's network in order to finding a, a data exfiltration scenarios. And they were telling me we have the web security solutions and only that device can connect to, to the internet. So all the clients has to go through that box. And if you find a different way to exfiltrate the data, that would be nice. And I was like, okay, so what happens if you find a, another zero day vulnerability on especially the web security and the content filtering solutions? So the, uh, when the attacker um, managed to execute a code on the client network for the data exfiltration and the C2 communication phase, they can exploit the content filtering solution. So this is the today's topic. We are going to talk about the zero day vulnerabilities that I found on a very, very interesting product. And I have a case study for you. Um, uh, there is a product from the Trend Macro uh, inter, uh, Interscan Web Security Virtual Appliance, and um, I have done the vulnerability research on specifically that solutions, and we are going to see what kind of vulnerabilities that I managed to find 
and using all of those vulnerabilities together, uh, we are going to see some sort of code executions in the end. But before diving into the case study, I would like to a little bit talk about what is the content filtering in order to make it crystal clear to everyone. Uh, as you can see in the picture, there is a computers on the left, which represents a client's network of the company. And those devices doesn't, um, don't have a, a direct internet access. They have to go to the proxy service first, and that proxy service goes to the internet so that the organization can uh, do some sort of analysis and the rules on the client's network. So content filtering is happening in here right now. We can imagine that the content filtering solutions, uh, they are kind of spatially uh, implemented proxy service. And that term is given to do controlling the type of web content that employees guests, customers can access while they are connected to the business wired or wireless network so that the business may want to apply control over the type of a content that can be accessed to stop employees by restricting, you know, accesses to a certain type of web pages. And on top of that, also the content filtering is a quite a good place to ensure malicious web pages cannot be accessed, such as those used for phishing, malicious, distributing malware, etc., etc. So we are uh, targeting that kind of products in, in this presentation. So at the beginning, I was like, I have a two main motivation, like a targeting web filter solutions, why we, why, why we are doing this. And first and foremost, obviously, you know, all the clients network are going to the internet through that solutions, that means if we manage to break in, we're gonna see the whole client's network internet traffic of the organization. And second motivation is, as I told you before, client's computer don't have a network access to the internet, they must go, they must go through the web filter. So uh, we need to find a better way to CT communication in the red teaming scenarios. And I believe web filter solutions is a quite uh, secure and stealth way to make a CT communication. Uh, of course, there is a lot of different approach like a DNS beaconing, et cetera, et cetera. But I believe that is a very secure and stealth way. So, all right, that is the brief introduction to the idea and the main motivation. And this is the methodology that I usually follow for my vulnerable to research projects. And it, there is a seven steps, and we're gonna see every single step in details throughout the case study. And first and foremost, we have to find a way to get a free trial of the product that we're going to do vulnerability research on it, because uh, you have to, you know, break into operating system level, and you need to find all the source code and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and you have to test your vulnerabilities, and eventually you're gonna implement the exploit. Uh, for the vulnerabilities you found. So uh, you have to find a way to get a free trial and it's not quite easy guys always. It's not quite easy. It's sometimes, and most of the times it requires to have a lot of meeting with the sales team. And if you find a, if you find a free trial of the product, uh, I strongly suggest you to start by reading the documentation because there is an administrative documentation of these type of solutions and there's a huge technical information about the product itself. So after that, we are going to uh, find a way to have a, a root SSH access to the box because we are going to do the vulnerability research. And uh, most of the case, there is operating level uh, uh, hardening and we need to get rid of all of those you know, hardening stuff. And after that, you, know, you are in a situation where you manage to install the software, I mean, the solution, you read the documentation and you, manage to overcome the operating level system uh, hardening. And that is the moment that you need to start using product itself like a regular user, because you have to understand all the features because those information will be uh, come so handy when you need to define a possible attack vector. So after that, we are going to talk about the enumeration and the configuration uh, step. And the most important phase is the defining possible attack vectors because you got all the information you need. 
and it is a time to building uh, attack scenarios and then find a vulnerability as a final step. We are going to see every single step throughout our case. And in that case, I mean the Trend Micro uh, Interest Cam Web Security Virtual Appliance uh, 6.5 version. You can download it from the vendor web page. Uh, so getting a free trial was quite easy, in, 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 specifically in that case. Uh, if you go to the Google and looking for the administrative documentation is an important keyword in here for the Google search. Um, uh, you can directly find the administrative file, which is usually like a 300 pages. Um, I strongly suggest you to read uh, administrative documentation because you're going to see very, very uh, helpful uh, information about the product. As you can see in here, um, administrative documentation tells us there is a different modes of the product. It can be transparent breach mode. It can be transparent uh, breach mode with high availability. Forward proxy, reverse proxy, uh, ICAP, WCCP, et cetera, et cetera. So, and that product can be installed very different modes. And on the right side, you are seeing the forward proxy mode, which tells you, you know, this, that product can participate in a proxy chain, forward all the traffic to the upstream proxy servers. And you will be seeing uh, lots of graphics on the administrative documentation, which will help you to understand about the product itself. So we are reading the funny manual as well. And we, of course, uh, for the third step, after the reading the documentation, you need to install the solution into your visualization and the visualization system. Um, uh, during the installation, there was an admin user and the password has been set during the installation and the product gives you uh, a opportunity to do SSH connection to the box with the administrator user. But the problem is there was a restricted shell on the SSH. There is a very, very limited tools that you can use in the SSH interface of the product. And we need to find a way to uh, have a, a directly SSH uh, connection with the root user because we are going to do remote debugging. We want to uh, try to find out all the uh, source codes and we're going to do further analysis, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there's a little bit of a step before starting to the vulnerable research. Um, in that case, it was like a quite easy because the product was distributed by the vendor uh, as an ISO file. So you can directly install it into your VMware or VirtualBox. And when you finish the installation, uh, the idea is you can detach the VM Deca disk from the virtual machine that you just installed, and then you can attach it to the different Linux machine. And then you're going to mount new disk and you are going to find a graph file because there was a password protection on the graph file and I want to get rid of that uh, protection as well. And you just need to remove the password protection line on the graph file. And after that, in order to get rid of the restricted shell thing, you can go to the SHT config file and you can enable remote root login. And if you do that, you need to go to the etc pass video file and add bmbash for the root user, which will give us a direct SSH connection with a root user without having uh, any restricted shell at all. And we have to un undo every single thing that we have done so far. So that means you need to unmount the disk detach the VM backup file and attach it back to the original VM and reboot the machine, actually. And in that case, you are going to have the direct root SSH connection to the box. This is important. We need to get rid of you know, operating level hardening. So we are kind of ready to start using product itself. Uh, in that case, I choose the reverse proxy mode, um, but I believe all the vulnerabilities that we have found it exists uh, no matter what is the installation mode at all. Um, for the fourth step, I strongly suggest you to use a product for a day to get used to about the features itself, because there is a lot of functionality, as you can see in the picture. There is a URL access control, HTTP decryption. You know, we right now we know that product can offload the SSL at all. That means we can deploy SSL through the administrator interface. And there is an advanced threat protection 
uh, on the left side of the menu, as you can see, I hope you are seeing my mouse pointer in here. There is advanced stress protection. That means all the HTTP or HTTPS traffic will be analyzed by the product in order to find out uh, malicious activities because of that feature. So later of those, later of that presentation, guys, we are going to see how important it is to understand and getting familiar with the product interface. Yeah, it's quite important. Just use it like a normal user. So we have a search access with a root user. So the initial step is always enumerating the services. This is what I'm doing. Of course, that would be a you know better way to do it, but this is my way to do. So I always looking for the Nasdaq command to find out what kind of services we have in the in the product itself. Um, as you can see in here, there is a UWSGI, which listings the port 6011. That means, you know, we are doing some sort of assumptions in that phase. So that most probably means there is a Python project running in the internal system. And there is a Java process which listings exact port of the administrator interface. That means we are going to deal with the Java uh, when the time comes to do, doing a research on the administrator interface. Uh, there's another UWSGI in here. And that is another important thing because, as I said before, that product acts as a proxy service. So that must be as some service on the product itself in order to handle incoming HTTP connections from the user. So I as uh, IWSSD process you are that you are seeing in here, which distance for 8881. Uh, this is uh, responsible for all the incoming connection from the client's network. So this is the majority uh, part of the product itself because that is the one who is communicating with the clients. All right, so. Those are the services that we have in the product, but we need to find which of those services are allowed to communicate with the different uh, computers in the network, because in the end, we need to uh, exploit at least one of those services. So the uh, what I'm doing for to find out that information, I usually run an MF scan from, the, from my main host to the product. IP address, or you can just use the IP table dash dash list command to find out, you know, the uh, IP tables rules. So according to that rule, you know, most of the internal services has been forbidden, you know, to uh, network traffic from the outside of the machine. Um, you guys are remembering, you know, uh, the IS, uh, IWSGI service, you know, um, if you keep doing enumeration, we are seeing very interesting information in here. As you can see in, in here, there is a supervisor D which is responsible for starting the solar service. So we right now we know there is a Apache solar and lots of Python uh, services in the box. So what is Apache solar? Um, it is an open source enterprise search platform written in Java. Uh, it's a major feature is include the full text search, uh, highlighting the time indexing, dynamic clustering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, that means that Python project that we are seeing in here is responsible for reading and writing the log file into the uh, Apache Solar service. So most probably, whenever the request comes to the proxy service from the client's network, that that proxy service is sending some sort of signals to the Python project that we have seen in here. It's something like a you know internal microservice. So that Python project is taking the information and writing it into the uh, Apache Solar service. So whenever the administrator user try to query something through the administrator interface, that request will be coming to the Python project as well because the naming convention in here is says the dashboard parse, mains, stats parse, summary parse, you know, there's a lot of log parsing and writing to the uh, Apache Solar Service and whenever it needs to be, get, it needs to be uh, the access by the administrator interface. 
and that Python project is taking the responsibility again. So it is quite important to know there is an Apache Solar Service within the box, but unfortunately, um, due to the IP tables rule that we have in here, we're not gonna be able to directly communicate with Apache Solar in the, at the beginning, but later of the presentation, we will find a way to do it. So, all right, let's talk about IOS, uh, IWS SSD process. Uh, if you grab it, from the process tree, you are seeing the full path of the binary. And if you look for the file type, it is a symbolic link to the IS, IWSS process, which is uh, SUID LFI binary. And there is a 61 module in that binary. So it's a very huge binary. And we can, of course, target that process at, uh, target that process, but it will be requiring lots of reverse engineering. So, of course, we are going to do that uh, at some point, but uh, one of the most important attack surface, as you can imagine, it is a proxy service itself. So, so far, I believe I just spent 20 minutes, uh, I guess, and we managed to collect uh, enough level of information uh, about product itself. So it is time to define attack vectors in a light of those information that we got so far. So we know that administrator interface is written with Java. And there is a proxy service which is written with C++. Uh, I haven't told that before, but it is a C++, guys. It's my best story. And there is a lot of internal services, but most of them are not accessible from outside of the box. And you guys are remembering, you know, SSL decryption and advanced, uh, advanced threat protection features of the administrative interface. So we know that it uh, does offloading the SSL, it pours HTML content, scan files, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, my idea at that phase, my idea was, okay, let's start with the administrative interface and we can go after proxy servers uh, if it needs to be, you know, uh, let's start with the administrator interface at the beginning. Uh, but there is a lot of possible attack scenarios, uh, as you can imagine, you know, uh, one of the, uh, if, if you want to, let's say, target the HTML parser of the product, like a browser exploitation, you can just send that phishing email to the, uh, one, of the uh, one of the employees of the company that contains a link. Whenever the user clicks on that link, that request will be uh, sent to the proxy service and proxy service is going to take that request from the client and it's going to send exactly the same request to the destination server, which is a web page that attacker can control. And whenever the proxy service uh, gets the response, it performs analysis. It has to parse HTML content and scan, uh, scan the file. So that means you can directly uh, attack to the HTML parser engine of the product. Uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of different possible attack vectors. You know, that was just one example that just popped in my mind right now during the presentation. But um, and we are going to talk about the administrative interface, and then we're going to talk about the proxy service. Um, you know. As you know, it is a Java project and I love, I like to working on the Java project. And every single time, whenever I facing with a Java application, I always start by reading the configuration file because, you know, the web.xml, stress.xml, you know, all of those XML files contains a very good, uh, high level of understanding information about the software that we are going to do, uh, vulnerable to research. And I don't want to live in an SSH connection during wall vulnerable to research. So we need to find that all the location of the jar file by using just find command on the step two. And then you can copy all of them to your main host to further analysis uh, because uh, we are going to deal with lots of jar files. And I strongly suggest you to use IDEs. Um, I used to use GDGUI for the compiling of the JAR files, but those kind of project has uh, hundreds of different JAR files. And if you put all of those JAR files into the GDGUI, it wasn't working for me. It was just crashing or freezing. 
because it has to decompile all the class and the functions and they need to find all the cross calls. Uh, so I strongly suggest you to use IntelliJ or Eclipse for that purpose. And if you are, if you are up to use the IntelliJ IDE, there is a Java the compiler.jar file under the, um, the compiler library, which comes by default with IntelliJ, I guess. And you can compile all the jar files under the lib folder. You can change the name, of course. And we are going to put all the decompile files under the lib dash decompile folder. And if you go to the IntelliJ interface and look for the project settings, there is a library section in here. You can import those libraries and sources all together, uh, which will uh, tell the IntelliJ to this is my you know Java software and IntelliJ will take the rest of the job. It's gonna process all the classes and you're gonna be able to just you know finding a function that you are interested and in, you will be just clicking it to go to the definition and also you can find a very interesting function that might be a, some problem in the definition. You can just by using the IDEs, you can find all the different locations where the specific that function has been called. So I strongly suggest you to be a friend with you know IntelliJ or Eclipse if you are up to uh, vulnerable research on Java application, guys. So uh, I beg your pardon. So we have an access to the source code of the administrator interface. So. We are ready to do uh, for the last step, which was uh, finding a vulnerability. There is a different approach to do it, like uh, you know, top to bottom or bottom to top. You know, uh, bottom to top means you know the potentially vulnerable functions on the Java, let's say, and you can directly search those functions within the code base, and if you if you believe that you just find a very interesting, very insecure way to use those potential vulnerable function, you can start from the bottom to go to the top in order to find out whether you are controlled to a parameter that passed through all the function calls. Or you can start from top to bottom, which is like, you know, uh, start by reading the filter or the middle layer definitions and the classes, look for the authentication mechanism, and then search for all the controller or the uh, request handler definition, which will uh, which will be an important because that is the location where you can see the uh, user controller parameters, etc., etc. In that case, I was doing top to bottom approach. Uh, I choose that approach uh, for because of not very specific reason. I was like, you know, doing uh, fun, funny time on the Sunday and I was just start reading the source code and it was like a, a top to bottom approach. And um, uh, I wish I could show you all the code bases and everything, but I believe I don't have enough time to do it. So I just grab a very specific function definition, uh, which name is a mount device. Uh, it has to be a post request to uh, be able to execute the function definition. And there is a very interesting uh, if statement in here. Uh, it tells you if the request is coming from the local host, it is okay. But if the request is not coming from the local host, I'm gonna validate your session and your privilege as well. Since we don't have the username, the password, you know, uh, this is going to be a problem for us because it is a password protections if the request is not coming from the local host. And there is a one function call in here, get token, which will be uh, have a very important role on our exploitation. We will uh, come back in later. So uh, that was the important part of the function and we are moving to do more important stuff. So it, takes, it, it tells us that the request must be a post request and the post body, it is taken from the request and it is a JSON object. And we're gonna get the one device to drink from the JSON uh, data. And that part is quite interesting because it performs some sort of escaping. So if the one device contains a double code, it will be escaped. 
if it contains a backtick dollar sign, it will be escaped uh, by the backslash. But the problem is, if it contains backslash, it will escape backslash one more time. So if we have the double quote, it will be escaped one time and it will be escaping backslash one more time in here. There is a, some sort of problem in here. And after that, there is a function call, which is a is valid mount device. Uh, and it takes our parameter that we can control. And if you manage to pass that if statement, we are going to see exe UI help with CMD, which is tend to execute operating system uh, command. Uh, with a parameter that we are controlled. So we need to skip that if statement, it has to be returned true. And so let's have a look at that one. Is valid mount device, it is just like a very weak blacklisting. It tells you it cannot be contained bash, bin as such, Python slash Perl, Python, et cetera, et cetera. It validates. Uh, it performs some sort of blacklisting on that one. But the problem is it has the white space at the beginning of the Perl and the Python command in here. So it's a very weak blacklisting. We can bypass that without having any problem. So we have to keep that in, my, in our mind uh, if you've managed to find a vulnerability. So, all right, we can pass that part and we can reach in here. So it is time to read the exe UI helper CMD. And exe UI helper CMD, it is going to execute UI helper binary with a sub CMD, which is uh, a command that we can control. So what is UI helper? It is a located in here and it has a root privilege and there is a SUID bit. So all the commands will be executed with a root user. So if you find a way to execute our command, that command will be executed with the root privileges, which is something very, very important for us. And finally, that function calls exacmd, which is basically calls runtime.getRuntime.exec. So obviously we have command injection vulnerability in here. So when the, we have, we believe that we have the vulnerability in here and we need to do the proof of concept. Um, thanks to the reading of funny manual and the product feature steps of the methodology, we, we know where is, uh, which uh, administrator interface, I mean, which many of them, it is going to execute that specific endpoint. Of course, you can build it from scratch, but this is more easier for me. And as you can see, that is the post request and there is a month device and we can inject our command in here because the dollar sign, it is, will be used for the execution and the dollar sign escape one time and the backslash escape one more time, which means there is no escaping at all that backslash escaping did another one and there is nothing related with the dollar sign which will helping us to inject our command. So basically we are executing sleep command with a 15 uh, seconds with administrator with a root privilege. So let's talk about the exploitation of that vulnerability as well. I, I, I'm one of the exploit uh, contributors and I'll, I, I usually, uh, you know, using the Python dropper for the exploitation when I especially exploiting the Linux machines. Um, but there's a one problem about the Python dropper from the MSF Venom of the Metasploit. It has to be include the double uh, code that wraps up our dropper command in order to pass it to the Python process. So that means we're not gonna be able to directly use it because uh, as you know, the double code has been escaped on the backend service. So, the idea is that we can use Perl because Perl can take a parameter with a single code, which is allowed to use. And basically the idea is simple. Uh, I want to execute Python dropper, but I'm gonna put that Python uh, command into the Perl command. So basically during the exploitation, we are going to execute Perl, which is going to execute first step of the Python dropper, when the Python executed, it communicates with the handler and the handler sends the second stage. So there is a, you know, lots of execution uh, one and after. And there is a Ruby code, as you can see in here, that we can build a 
Perl command, which includes, which contains our Python command. So it's a quite nice trick. So I reported that vulnerabilities to the ZDI. And of course, ZDI told me that the authentication is required to exploit that vulnerability. But we are going to see that the exploitation can be bypassed, guys. So we have to bypass authentication. Those are the initial ideas. We can find a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability because we can force the authenticated user to send HTTP request to the one device endpoint where we have the command injection. And since the user is going to be uh, manipulated by JavaScript, that request will be uh, sent to the endpoint with the authenticated user. So we don't have to be thinking about the authentication request, authentication stuff. And uh, another idea is it would be handy to find something as a Seraphish vulnerability, some sort of some type of SSR vulnerability quite uh, could be handy in order to communicate with internal services so that we can send a request from the localhost to the endpoint or we can go directly after the authentication bypass. Um, I don't have too much time. I'm just going to show you how I find the stored cross-site scripting on the administrative interface. So uh, as you can see in here, that is a very basic uh, HTTP request to the proxy service. It tells to the proxy service that I'm gonna, you know, uh, that I want to send a GET request to the pen test blog, and proxy service does the job and sends the response back to the user. So that activities is been written into the administrator interface. Guys, remember the Python and the Apache Solar stuff that we hold, that we have talked uh, 15 minutes ago. And um, you know that activities has been written to the uh, Apache Solar database, which is represented into the administrator interface. So the idea is that we can control that data in here because we can tell anything we want to that uh, process service. So the idea is quite simple. Uh, as an attacker, we are going to intentionally download a very, very known malware through the proxy service. So proxy product can detect it and produce a log file and it will be like, you know, ringing all the alarms, you know, I, I call the malware, et cetera, et cetera. But the data will be written into the Apache Solar which is being used in the administrator interface and very, very specifically in here. So when the system administrator logs in and checks the what's happening, we can execute JavaScript code on the uh, system administrator browser. And thanks to that JavaScript code, we can send the IX request to the vulnerable endpoint that we have found in the first place. So, you know, there was a quite interesting XSS vulnerability because whenever the browser is sending requests to the proxy, they are performing the full URL encoding in here, but I'm manually crafting to HTTP request to the proxy service. That means there will be a no encoding and that data is not being encoded on the administrator interface. Basically, we have a cross-site scripting, special the stored cross-site scripting vulnerability in here. So instead of popping up uh, alert box, we are just we can just call uh, IX request to the endpoint that we have the command injection. So that was I reported that vulnerability to the ZDI as well. And as you can see in the vulnerability description, attacker can leverage this in a conjunction with other vulnerabilities to execute code in the context of the, uh, of the root user. But guys, you know, cross-site scripting is a cool, I'm not underestimating any kind of vulnerabilities, but it is just not enough for me because there is a huge setback which requires the user interaction for the exploitation. I was like, okay, I just find something very cool, you know, intentional downloading of malware, et cetera, et cetera, that idea was simple and cool, but uh, I need to find a better way to continue the exploitation. But, you know, uh, I got another idea while I was spending a time to find the XSS through the proxy service. So the idea is targeting proxy service itself. So as you can remember from the previous slides, that is the HTTP request, the very simple HTTP request to the proxy service itself. It tells the proxy service that I want to communicate with the pentest.blog. 
proxy service sends the request, get the response, and sends back to the user, right? So what happens if I tell the proxy service that I want you to communicate with yourself? In that case, it told me there is a you know self-referential self request to proxy are forbidden. And I was like, all right, that means there is a, some sort of uh, controls and lots of if statements in the proxy service itself. What happens if I manage to trick the proxy service to communicate with an internal service? That was the main idea. So that is the function, get and user other notification function. I set a breakpoint in here, which produced exactly same error message that we have seen in here. And I just sent the same request and it hit the breakpoint and it tells you that get user notification or the notification has been called by the prepare proxy loop rejection, which has been called by the handle proxy loop, which has been called by the due processing. So um, we're going to read all of those functions. So within the due processing, there is a um, one function call, which is an easy reverse proxy. Uh, and the function is the member of the HTTP proxy config cache. So basically product try to understand like uh, am I being placed as a reverse proxy? And in that case, handle proxy loop has been called, uh, this function that we have seen on the previous slide. And that function calls TM socket address is same ADDR. That is the important part because that function performs full URL comparison with a URL of the proxy service with uh, a URL of the user try to communicate. So if it is a same address, it calls prepare proxy loop rejection call and we are seeing that error message. So I just changed the port number to the Apache Solar Service. And due to that changes, there will be a no match in the full URL comparison on the proxy service. And there is an administrator interface of the Apache Solar Service. And I'm just can communicate with it because of a very interesting bug in the, in the proxy service. So I, as you can see in here, I'm allowed to communicate with the Apache Solar Service administrator interface. So, all right, that was a, another a very, very, very important vulnerability because we can, we are going to um, leverage this vulnerability to the bypass authentication on the systems. And in the end, we're gonna chain all of them together, guys. So uh, Apache Solar service in the box, I mean, in the product was very old version because it's not quite easy to upgrade your third party dependencies like Apache Solar or database servers. And in these type of solutions, it's quite hard to upgrade to newer versions. So there was a very, very old vulnerability in Apache Solar Service, but it is exactly what I need. It is an arbitrary file read vulnerability. So um, there is, that is the name of the collection and there is a replication endpoint and the command has to be a file content and you can traverse back to the root folder and then you can call whatever you want and that will give you to reading any content of the file. So um, at the beginning, I wasn't, uh, there was no way to communicate with the Apache Solar Service, but we find a very interesting bug. And by exploiting that bug, we are going to read anything we want. So far, so good. I want you to remind the get token function. You know, it was like a way behind of our presentation. Guys, all right. Do you remember that get token function? It is going to help us what we are going to achieve in here. Because um, let me, yeah, because that function takes cookies from the HTTP request and it returns the value. But the problem is it's print out the value and the name of the cookies. But the Java application is running uh, by the Tomcat process. So those standard outputs data will be written into the log file, which is a Catalina.out file. So due to that little function, all of those valid session IDs 
written into the log file, and we have arbitrary file read vulnerability. So what we are going to do that, we're going to exploit two vulnerabilities together in order to get the content of the catalina.out file, which contains the valid session IDs. And then we are going to collect all the session IDs together, and we, are, we can go to administrator interface in order to exploit command injection vulnerability with the active session IDs. So the idea is actually quite simple, guys. We are going to, in the first step, we are going to exploit a comparison bug in the proxy service, which help us to communicate with the Apache solar service that is running within the product itself. And this is a very old software, which has a vulnerability and it is arbitrary to file read. And combination of that vulnerability, we are going to read catalina.out file. And we're gonna, by using regex, we're gonna extract all the session IDs that we have. And there is a check session endpoint. I have a talk about it because it was quite easy. Uh, there is a check session endpoint in the product. We are going to test all the session IDs we have in order to find out whether it is still active or not. And if you find an active session, we are going to exploit the command injection vulnerability and we are going to be executing operating system command with a root privilege, which will give us a C2 uh, reverse shell to our command and control server. That is the idea. And of course, I have implemented a Metasploit module that performs all of those steps automatically. And I have a video for it. Uh, I, I would like to, I guess, yeah, yeah, time is good. I guess I still have a minute. So um, let's see. And by the way, that Metasplit module has been merged to the master uh, branch of the Metasplit project. You are just, you know, can go and fetch the module and install the product on your lab and, you know, have fun. So when we run, as you can see in here, it's try to, it exploits reverse process service and extract the catalina.out file. And there was, of course, this is a demonstration. There's only one session IDs in the log file and it's an active. And by using that session IDs, it goes to the command injection vulnerability and it executes the operating system command, which is a Perl command. Perl command contains a Python command, you know, and all of those steps has been automatically done. And as you can see in here, we have a root session on the web filter solution of the company, guys. Um, that's it. Thank you very much.